Welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 147. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by the man with a plan, Mr. Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Mike, and what a day for planning, day for resilience, day for digging in deep it is today. How are you feeling? I'm I'm ready to get the job done, and I think today's show is going to help us do that. Yeah, I think you're totally right. Last week, we were hearing from Angela Duckworth and her studies, her research, her almost analytical look at the idea of grit, the idea of resilience and how important that is in all of our lives, particularly when we're either about to or currently going through things that are pretty hard day to day, Mike. If last week was all about laying a foundation for you and me and our listeners to see the value in grit, the value in cultivating a resilient mindset. This week, Mike, it's all about practicality. This week, we're going get digging into Eric Greetens' book, Resilience, Hard Won Wisdom for Living a Better Life. Yeah, it's all about getting resilience happening, making it something uh, that is reasonable, achievable, and uh, something within your means because As you said, Angela Duckworth, she made the case for why those that are resilient uh, win and win big. And we've discovered that on the show, whether it's Einstein, whether it's Joe Rogan and everything in between, we've seen resilience is a big part of success, way more than talent. Talent only gets you so far. Resilience and mindset is the game changer. And today... I think we are going to hear from somebody who has not only survived on the battlefields of war, but somebody who has helped um, millions of people to form a more resilient mindset, but to do it through hard-won wisdom. I think that is spot on. What a one-two punch, Angela and then Eric. Uh, Mark, I can't wait. No, exactly. Me neither. I think it's a great little pair because I think as Angela revealed to us, and as you just touched upon, Mike, we're all going to run into moments of hardship, of challenge, particularly in either our, our work lives, our careers, or our personal lives. It's unavoidable. Hardship is going to happen. So with Eric coming from you know the front line, as well as dealing with challenges in, in the personal life, and as we'll hear from some colleagues of his, he's really taken a look at how he got through different things in life, how he got through Navy SEAL training, how he gave practical advice to his friends so that you and I and our listeners can take a little bit of a lesson away from that. And what's Mm. interesting, Mike, is there's references in there that again date all the way back to ancient Greece. This idea of stoicism, once again, is Mm. coming through in a lot of this this idea and this work about resilience. Mm. This is like, for anyone who's enjoyed our Ryan Holiday series, which you can, if you haven't heard, you can go and grab at moonshots.io. We had a deep dive with uh, Ryan Holiday and his whole series of books around stillness, around obstacles, uh, or why our egos are such a big problem. Um, and in this show, we're going to um, take a, like a slightly uh, different tour. This is going to be someone who also has a love of the ancients and the Stoics, but somebody who talks about it through a lens of the practicalities of life. So I want you to think, I want you to imagine that we're going to have a look at how to prepare yourself to how to to cultivate resilience and then what you can do in the heat of the moment to hold on to that resilience because the biggest enemy here is giving up. And that's the thing that this show is really going to help you with. So with no further ado, let's set the scene together with Eric and how he frames his book, Resilience, Hard Won Wisdom for Living a Better Life. With no further ado, let's hear from the author himself. So this book came when I was driving down Highway 70 in the middle of Missouri and my buddy Zach Walker called me. Now, Zach is a tough kid from a Northern California logging family. He was in my buds class, my basic underwater demolition SEAL training class. And even in a SEAL training class, he was one of the toughest of the tough guys in this in this class. And we stayed friends after we left the training. He went to the East Coast. I stayed on the West Coast. And he came back uh, from a deployment in Afghanistan. 
And when he came back, things were going all right at first. He was a good father to his two young kids. He bought a concrete pumper. He started a small business. And then uh, his life was just hammered by hardship. Uh, what happened was his brother died. Uh, he lost his business. Then one day, he drove his truck into his driveway. He got out of the truck and fell to the ground because he believed that there was a sniper watching him. And he laid there for hours until the sun went down. And then he got up and he ran into, the, into his house and he realized he had post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and then he started drinking. And on the weekend, it was not a six-pack, but a cooler full of beer that he was working on. And he called me after he'd been arrested. So you had this guy who was a Navy SEAL war hero coming home from Afghanistan who now is the unemployed alcoholic on disability who's looking at having his kids come to visit him in jail. And we talked a lot that night. Uh, when I got home, I started writing him a letter. Uh, he wrote back to me, and we did this for months with letters back and forth. And the book now is a series of edited letters to my friend, Zach Walker, about how you can take a lot of this wisdom that's in our philosophical and religious traditions, how you can take a lot of wisdom from your own experience and use it to build a resilient life. What a great little introduction from Eric, Mike. Oh, I mean, this speaks to me so much. Yeah, I mean, I can't relate to the undeniable hardships that both Eric as well as his friend, uh, Zach, who suffers from that, that PTSD, have, have been through. I, I couldn't even imagine. But as I you know, think about the stresses or the seeming stress, I suppose, the illusion of stress that I have day to day, this concept of determining how to build that resilient life through um, their experience and the teachings of of others. I mean, I'm I'm so ready to to learn from from Eric and, and his book. I think um, what's so great is this frames the writing and the wisdom and the thinking of Eric Greetens because you can you can see here that he's packaging it up for for a friend who's going through immense hardship. And look, the practical and the most baseline reality is we all face challenge and obstacles. So if now you've kind of kind of leveled out and you can say, hey, Stuff ain't perfect, but that's all right because we have a lot of answers here. And um, the, you know, the wisdom that we're about to decode and to apply to our lives, it's so damn practical. It's not necessarily easy to do, but it is definitely powerful for us because it really is very crisp, well-articulated arguments for how we can tackle hardship in our lives. And look, the reality is that most of us will face nothing like Zach. Uh, we we won't be in Afghanistan with people shooting at us. So therefore, if this was something that Eric could do to help him and, and many, many others, it can help you, our listeners. So all you moonshotters, I want you to know that what we're about to rip into is four big ideas, things that you can do in your life. And you should feel not overwhelmed at the idea of resilience, but you should feel excited that some of the practices that you can come to and use every single day are going to be in this show. So, I mean, that is, this is true moonshotter stuff, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, and it, it reminds me of a quote that I think we've covered on the show before, the idea re re of replacing fear of the unknown with curiosity. You know, that really spoke to me as we were digging mm. into Eric's work about resilience, mm. this fear of the unknown being something that I think we probably, a lot of us deal with day to day. But when mm. you, when you look at it with the lessons that we're going to learn today from Eric Greetens' book, along with a lens of curiosity, okay, what can I learn from this? How, how interesting is this experience to test me and see how I react to things similar to how Angela was revealing to us last week. That to me He's, he's kind of inspiring me to get out and try and live that more um, growth mindset life, I suppose. Yeah. I think this, this is really captured in an experience that we all have, which is public speaking and people often fear it. But, you know, the great coaches of public speak, speakers talk about transitioning from the fear of speaking in front of people to the excitement mm. to speak to people. And what shifts you there? Preparation. What this book is by Eric Greetens, Resilience, Hard Won Wisdom for Living a Better Life. It's preparation. And I think preparation is something we know that you, our listeners, 
really love to do. I mean, that's why you're listening to the show to prepare yourselves to be the best version of yourselves. And before we play the first clip, Mark, we should welcome the new moonshotters, the new members that have signed up to be part of this. So, Mark, who do we need to welcome today? Yep. I want to welcome uh, Byron Jones, Tom Osmond, Dietmar Bauer. Uh, we're saying hello again to Ken, to Marjolin, Sandy, Neil, Bridie, Terry, John, Niels, and our grandfather, moonshotter member, Bob Nolly as well. We've got all sorts of exciting members joining us uh, day to day, week to week on our member series, Mike. And we really appreciate you becoming members because your support, um, becoming uh, uh, patrons of our Moonshots podcast means, number one, you don't hear any crappy ads on the show. I mean, how good is that, Mark? Uh, give me an ad-free life any day. <laughs> oh, hey, Mark, uh, do you want to get a Squarespace website? Uh, yeah, come on, let's talk about Squarespace. What else What else are all the really crappy ads we always hear? Uh, uh, it, there's a lot of CRM systems like monday.com. I see a lot of those. Yes. What else? Yep. Um, I'm getting a lot of home gym. Home, home gym, gym setups. Yeah. yeah, those are coming through on my YouTube. The Moonshots Workout Pack brought to you by whatever. <laughs> None of that, ladies and gentlemen. So we ask that, um, you know, that we kind of exchange value together. Mark and I and the whole team at Moonshots, we package together for you a show every single week. And in return, we ask you to become members. That's it. It's like a dollar a week. Support us. Um, right now, I think uh, our current members can just, they, their contributions just cover only one of our hosting packages um, that we need to, to do this show. So we need a lot more support. So dig deep, give us your support at moonshots.io. Um, join in the adventure of learning out loud together. Join in the discovery of your potential. See how good you can be. Let's learn from all these role models. Let's uh, bring our best versions to life. And we encourage you to do that at what destination, Mark? Pop along to www.moonshots.io, where not only can you sign up and become a member for Patreon, you can also listen to all of our weekly shows as well. You can check out our transcripts, our clip lists, our recommended reading lists, and all 147 shows, including this week's Eric Greetings and last week's Angela Duckworth, both part of our series on resilience. Okay. So um, talking about resilience, it's all about preparation and preparation is something that Eric Greetens has some wisdom to share. We all worry. And when you're worried, a lot of people will tell you, don't worry. It's usually terrible advice because you're going to worry anyway. So now you just feel bad about the fact that you're worrying. If you care about what you're doing, you are going to worry. That's a good thing. The key is to learn to worry productively. And the way to worry productively is to engage in a practice called mental rehearsal. In mental rehearsal, you imagine things that might happen, and then you imagine how you'll react. You imagine your way through difficulty. Stoic thinkers often called this the premeditation of evils. Seneca said everyone approaches a danger with more courage if he has prepared in advance how to confront it. Resilient people know that life is going to be hard, so they prepare themselves for hardship. Go ahead and imagine bad things that might happen. Imagine that you've misplaced your notes when you stand up to speak. Imagine that you've lost your job. Imagine that you've lost a loved one. Imagine that you're broke. Then imagine what you'll do to make it through. A Navy SEAL Master Chief mentor of mine, Will Guile, taught us that when you are ambushed by hardship, you can easily be overcome by events. And when you're ambushed and unprepared, you often don't react well. If you're going to spend time thinking about bad things that might happen, then use that energy for a purpose. Instead of wallowing in your worries, imagine how you'll respond to them. If that happens, I could do this. When you mentally rehearse, don't imagine success falling into your lap. Imagine everything. The tingling at the back of your neck, the fear in the pit of your stomach. Your mind is built to prepare for problems. The goal of mental rehearsal isn't to fill your head with happy thoughts about the future, but to prepare yourself to succeed in the real world. The naive mind imagines effortless success. The cowardly mind imagines hardship and freezes. The resilient mind 
imagines hardship, and prepares. You are built to deal with problems and challenges. I, I like this approach, Mike, this idea of preparing yourself for difficulties because, as Eric's already called out, you will run into challenges. You will run into hardships. So, Mike, I mean, I'm sitting here thinking, this is great. I, I should start looking at my challenges that I run into and even the free moments that I have during my day and utilize those feelings of maybe anxiety or worry more productively because I can learn from them and I think I can utilize them to become that little bit more resilient, right? Oh yeah. And, um, this is really good. I'll tell you from a personal perspective, the reason I like this is, um, I think I was a victim of over optimism in my earlier years. I think I was perhaps a little, you know, guilty of wishful thinking, oh, it'll be great. And then things unravel, but there's this really powerful thought that we had in the Dale Carnegie show, which is like, ask yourself, what is the worst that can happen? Now, this is really interesting because there's also some mental models based around uh, rather than saying, what do we need to do to succeed? What you can actually do is ask yourself what failure would look like and call out what are like the three things that would have happened if this was to fail. And then you can say, well, how do we prevent those three things from occurring? So you kind of flip everything around. And for those of you who are listening, who are maybe a little bit guilty of over-optimistic and wishful thinking like I have a tendency to be, this whole line of thinking, mental rehearsal, asking yourself what is the worst that can happen, or as the Stoics would say, the premeditation of evils, I find this in like just insanely powerful for someone who's an optimist like me. Marky, would you consider yourself an optimist or a pessimist, and, and how does it work for you? Um, you know what? I have a feeling I'm, I'm bridging between optimist and pessimist nowadays. Um, oh, sorry, no, optimist and, and realist. Um, sometimes, you know, perhaps the same as you might, I fall into the pessimist side and I think, what's the point? It's not going to work. Why should I spend any more time trying to make this thing happen? Why don't I just give up? Well, in that mode, did the Angela Duckworth uh, show help you by pointing out that well, it's natural to have those doubts, concerns, fears, and questions? Did that kind of give you a convincing argument to to keep going? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, the, the Angela Duckworth grit has actually had quite a resounding effect upon me since since last week, actually, Mike. Good. It's come up in my mind uh, quite, a, quite a number of times, actually, much like, as you called out, um, episode 119, Dale Carnegie, how to stop worrying. Yeah. You know, there were so many elements in, in both of those shows hmm. that have, you know, sunk into my, into my psyche. And I think you're right. I think when I was younger, I was probably a bit of an optimist as well. Hmm. Um, and the idea of grit and specifically today, the idea of resilience is how I can combat personally those moments when the worry or the anxiety really does turn me away from trying to solve the problem, yes. trying to find that resolution. And instead just kind of putting it away and thinking, nah, I can't, I can't deal with this, move on. Yeah. yeah so, so this mental rehearsal or premeditation of evils um, starts with asking the question, what's the worst that can happen? And then if you accept that, you know, the worst thing that could happen today is X, Y, and Z, then you can say, well, how do I prevent it? Like what would be the steps to take? And then if you are taking those steps, it is, it's strangely calming. Um, and you know what, often there's a whole lot of thinking that supports this idea that we often, uh, so much of what we worry about never actually occurs. Mm. What the fear that can grip us, the concern or the anxiety that can grip us actually doesn't turn out. So by doing this idea of mental rehearsal that Eric Greetens is talking about, we can then almost um, preempt, uh, premeditate if challenge is coming our way, which hopefully it is because it means you're really stretching yourself. Then actually when those things turn up, they don't shock you because you're, you've actually already considered that this may occur. So I love this idea of 
have a plan A, have a plan B, have a plan C, and know that it could get really ugly. And at the end of the day, invariably, if you have done mental rehearsal, you will have accepted what the worst that could have happened, but it actually didn't. So you actually say, huh, well, that's not such a bad result in the end, is it? And I think that's the power of this practice, mental rehearsal. Yeah. I mean, one of the ways, Mike, that I do it from a um, a practical perspective, I, I try and write things down. I'm a bit of a writer, so I like uh, either journaling or when I'm doing my work day to day, I'll put it in, you know, a Google doc maybe. And there might be a challenge. So I'll break it down. I'll think, well, you know, this could go wrong because uh, we might not get what we need. Or, well, this could go wrong because I know such and such is going on holiday. So we might experience some delays. So trying to almost write out, like you say, each of those experiences or things that could happen Yeah, it's very, very cathartic because once you've done that, it's no longer a jumble of words in my mind. Instead, I'm now looking at it on a page and it's contextualized. So that that mental rehearsal for me is all about bringing it out of my brain, putting it onto a piece of paper and then looking at it objectively and thinking, okay, well, yeah, I could could handle this. Maybe I need to go and talk to such and such, but this, this feels now achievable. Yeah. So, so one thing that Eric just pointed out as well is not only think about this premeditation of evils, but actually feel it in advance. And, you know, sometimes this can be misconstrued as being very negative, but I think when you choose to premeditate those evils, to mentally rehearse and accept that things could go bad and you're willing to um, entertain those thoughts, here's the thing. When you are choosing to entertain these thoughts, when you're rehearsing, hey, I'm going to try option A, if that doesn't work, B, C, you know, it could get really, uh, there could be some real challenge here. I accept that. If it happens, I'll probably think about it this way. What he's saying is feel it as well because you are choosing to. So it is very different to you being in the moment, being totally unprepared for things to go wrong and you freaking out, experiencing, you know, stress, anxiety, fear, flight, all of those sorts of things. You can be cool as a cucumber and just think about it. Think about great athletes who are mentally strong when the, when the hour comes, when the moment comes where they have to make the winning shot, they are prepared to do it. I think many of us, when we face great challenge, haven't done the mental rehearsal and we're not mentally and emotionally prepared, which is why we, what do we do, Mark? Uh, we give up. What else do we do when we're not mentally prepared? Yeah, we'll fall apart. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Blame, Blame, judgment, you know. Look at him. He didn't do that. Look at her. She didn't do this. It's not my fault, right? Yeah. Those are all the things that are symptoms of not having mentally rehearsed, not having asked what's the worst could happen and being prepared. What happens with great teams and great individuals is that they're prepared to be uncomfortable. They're prepared to be gritty as per Angela Duckworth, and they're ready uh, to, to fight hard for the wins in life, for living a better life. And I think this is a great starting point. But Mark, there's a follow-up thought from Eric is in there that is just as powerful. That's right. If mental rehearsal is, let's call it part one in our ability to prepare ourselves for difficulty, the idea of segmenting is equally as important. So now let's hear from Eric telling us about how we can use segmenting to build mental toughness. To be resilient, you have to build mental toughness. When I was going through the Navy SEAL training, there was a great mentor of mine, Navy SEAL Master Chief Will Guild, who taught me a really important mental toughness technique called segmenting. Now, segmenting is a fancy word for taking something that's really big, looks really scary, and breaking it down into really small and attackable pieces. And we saw at the hardest moment of the hardest week of the hardest military training in the world, why segmenting was so important. So what happened was we were going through Hell Week, and Hell Week is considered to be the hardest week of the hardest military training in the world. And over the course of that week, they've got you doing things like 
uh, physical training on the beach with logs that weigh several hundred pounds. They have you running races with your teams in out of the ocean. They have you running the obstacle course, running down the beach, swimming in the ocean. It's a week of intensive physical training. And the hardest moment of that week comes at the beginning of the second night. So for a lot of people, their adrenaline carries them through the first night, carries them through the next and then we arrived at the beginning of the second night and you're thinking to yourself, I am more tired and more exhausted and more beaten than I have ever been in my entire life. And what happened then was that the instructors brought everybody out and they had us watch on the beach as the sun was setting. And as the sun was going down, the instructors came out and they got on their balloons and they said, say good night to the sun. We're all watching the sun go down. Said, tonight is going to be the worst night of your lives. We're all watching the sun go down. And I can remember I was standing there and I saw out of the corner of my eye that something broke in the class. And people started running for the bell, running for it. And you could hear it going off ding, 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 ding as people quit our class. Now, what was amazing was after all of the difficult things that they'd asked us to do in the SEAL team training, Swim 50 meters underwater, swim down 50 feet and tie a knot, tie your feet together and your hands behind your back and make you jump in the pool. Who would have thought that the hardest moment of the hardest week of the hardest military training in the world would come when all they had actually asked us to do was to stand on the beach and watch the sunset. But what happened then and what happened throughout the training was it what made people quit was when they were thinking about how hard something was going to be, how painful something was going to be, how difficult something was going to be. What Master Chief Will Guile taught us was all you can do to be courageous is to master this moment. That's all you can do. So be strong, be focused on doing what you need to do right now. And if you build that mental habit of segmenting, and you build that kind of toughness, you'll become more resilient. What a great story that the uh, the seals were all freaking out when they were just standing watching the sunset and not when they were grinding it out in all these incredibly tough exercises. Can you relate to that, Mark? That that it was like that it was the 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 just the thought that they were telling the 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 seals you were about to have the toughest night of your life. I mean, that sounds pretty crazy, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I think there's a juxtaposition that uh, exists in what I would have anticipated or expected to be one of the uh, hardest bits. So what I would um, try to describe is physical hardships, so swimming underwater, lifting heavy weights, being physically tired is quite different to the mental uh, tiredness that we can experience when, you know, things are getting a little bit tough. And I think what Eric's calling out there is we'd made it, uh, me and the team, we'd made it through all these difficult things. Imagine being in a, thrown in a pool with your hands and your feet tied together, by the way. Mm -hmm. That's going to be mm -hmm. difficult. Yeah, no, and, nice. and the fear, the anticipated fear that he and his classmates had as, as the sun was going down and the, um, the master chiefs were, you know, calling out what's going to happen next is going to be even worse. That fear of the unknown was actually more challenging as they thought ahead than the physical side. And, and for me, I have, I think I've experienced that before, not mm. to this extent, of course, but my, I'm, my own worst enemy is often myself because I'll exacerbate things in my mind or catastrophize things in my mind to an extent where I'll, almost be um, afraid of a situation. And, and that I think is pretty consistent with the story that Eric's breaking down in the segmenting clip, because he's saying, well, people were folding at just the idea of what was going to happen next without even seeing what it was. It was imagined. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this, this kind of really speaks to um, the, the fact that the things, the outcomes that you're imagining that have yet to occur are causing such fear that they went, rang the bell and left the, the program. Isn't that, isn't that fascinating? Because I think if we all pause for a moment, that we're all victims of over-processing the possibilities of the future when they actually have yet to occur. I mean, you can 
in a disciplined way do mental rehearsal, but you don't need to keep coming back to experiencing the dread or the worry of something that has not happened because it may in fact not happen. So how many times in life, Mark, have you experienced this thing where you worried a lot about something and it turned out to be something you didn't need to worry about? Have you ever had that? Uh, So many times. And the truth is I still do it. I still go through those processes, even after spending however many years in a career uh, as well as life, you know, dealing with all of that. Isn't it crazy? Mm. Mm. (laughs) Mm. So here, here's the, the, um, really powerful practice of segmenting. And I will, uh, I'll tell it a little bit through the, the show that we did on Eckhart Tolle and the power of now. So segmenting says, look, I appreciate that you have this big grand vision and purpose that you want to achieve in life. I appreciate, um, that, um, I'm going to do mental rehearsal and prepare for things not kind of working out. But the, the way you can see that the, the Navy SEALs that got through this moment, they did something where they came back into the now. Because those that rang the bell mark, here's what I propose, they were too busy worrying about the future, right? Yeah, that's exactly how I hear it. Yep. Yeah. So they're worrying about the future to such an extent that they can't even enjoy a sunset. They're just freaked out, right? Mm. So here's what Eric in his book says that you can do in the moment, which has great parallels with the show that we did uh, on the power of now. What the thinking is, is this, there is, you can reflect on the past. That's fine. But there is no benefit for causing worry uh, or uh, in the case of the past, regrets about the past. Something that's happened it happened. Okay. You can learn from it, but don't go back and feel both mentally, emotionally, and physical. Don't go and keep dragging that back up because it's in the past. So regretting the past is a very much a non-segmenting practice. Mm. What Eric would say is forget about the past. Like the cadets and the Navy SEALs looking at the sunset, you have to stop worrying about the future, okay? Because, you know, just because they're saying it will be the worst night of your life, maybe when you finish it, you might say, it was the hardest thing I ever did and I'm so proud Mm. and it was great, right? It wasn't nice, but it was great for me, okay? So back to the segmenting. So what do you do? With segmenting, you appreciate that you've planned for the past, planned for the future, You've, you've learned and reflected on the past, no regrets, no worries. You bring yourself into the now. This is how you segment. What you do is you go and listen to, which show number was Eckhart Tolle? I can't remember, but uh, go uh, and listen to e- a, a very good uh, number, episode one, two, three. Okay, so episode 123 of the Moonshots podcast, we spend the whole show going into this segmenting the power of now. So what do you do when you think about power of now? You, you, you basically go to your senses. Can I feel, smell, see, hear? This all brings you into the moment. Can I breathe? Can I put one foot forward in front of the other? Can I hear the birds? This is the now. So if you're a Navy SEAL cadet in Hell Week, you have to stand on the beach, the sun is setting, and they're telling you it's going to be the toughest night of your life. You say, can I stand? Can I see the waves? Can I smell the sea salt? Can I appreciate the breath that I am taking? This is the core practice to prevent oneself from regretting the past and worrying about the future. I'm not going to say it's easy, but these these segments, bringing yourself into the now, just being in the moment, becoming very uh, grateful for each step. If you're eating a meal, 
save it each byte. These are all things that Eckhart Tolle talks about. And this makes up this process or this practice of segmenting. And it's incredibly powerful because look, Mark, we have to think about getting into the power of now because we don't want to be those guys that run for the bell and ring the bell because just the thought of a tough night freaks us out, do we? Well, I I liked what you said um, a, a moment ago, actually, and I want to revisit it. It might actually be one of your best nights yeah. because you complete it, much like yeah. a marathon or a race of some kind. If you train for it and you're going through it, oh, this is tough. Yeah. But when you finish it, you've interacted fully, you've really immersed yourself into that moment and you've, you've completed it. You can look back, whether it's with uh, uh, you know, relief or pride or whatever it might be, when you know that you've completed it and you dug in deep, and you pushed as hard as you could, that's a feeling that nobody else can give you. Only exactly. you can give yourself that. Totally true. So there you have it. This is all about preparing yourself, setting yourself up to be resilient, to be gritty, mentally rehearse, and then segment in the moment. Those are great ways to get yourself prepared, ready to do the job, ready to go and embrace the discomfort, to go out and do something that really means something that's like an extension of your purpose, that helps people around you, that serves people around you. What a great start. It's a bit of a relief to to dig into this somewhat ominous uh, topic of resilience, isn't it, Mark? It's it's pretty empowering, isn't it? I, I think it's quite natural that we will hear stories like with Angela from a research perspective and now from Eric from a a physical Navy SEAL perspective because resilience quite literally interacts or engages every single person, doesn't it? It's something Mm. we all, we don't get taught it. It's not something that we'll cover in school, but it's something that we almost learn dynamically throughout life. And actually, as as we found in today's episode, as well as last week's, it's something that deserves attention, much like the show on Eckhart Tolle, you're right. There is a parallel there that teaches us how to be more resilient and patient and cope with anxieties and worries Mm. because it's something that we all need to kind of learn as we get older. You know, it's becoming more and more of a topic that I think is in the forefront of my mind as I'm coping with different pressures and so on. It's, it's such a huge topic that it's quite exciting to me to really dig into it and understand how I can be a little bit more resilient every day. Yeah, good stuff. I'll tell you what else is good stuff, and that's our new master series that we've been producing, Mark. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty cool that we have a second show, don't you think? Yeah, that's right. Listeners, you can pop along, uh, go and join us. Come and join us on the Moonshots um, member site where you can not only check out our first episode, which Mike, was all about a little thing. Motivation. Called, uh, motivation. If, if there's anything that we really need to be motivated, you can go and really understand a comprehensive deep dive into the concept of motivation. Then, Mike, we dug into uh, this little thing called first principles, I think. I mean, that was a pretty big topic, right? Mental models. Oh, my gosh. Huge. I love them. I wish I had more time to read up on mental models. Exactly. Well, listeners and members, you can go and check out our deep dive into first principles over on the members page. And Mike, we've even launched our third episode on teamwork. And that, I've got to admit, teamwork was one of my favorite topics that we've done so far, just because again, it's something that we we'll, we don't necessarily learn it necessarily, but it's something that impacts all of our lives. And there's so much content and lessons and advice that we can dig into and learn with regards to teamwork and how we can collaborate better and communicate better yeah. with other people. So true. So true. I mean, I mean, it's, um, you know, teamwork is essential to success, but I don't think it's spoken about enough. I don't think there's uh, enough training of individuals on how to be good teammates. Um, so that's why we did that show, Uh, on the Moonshots Master Series. And if you would like to get access to the Moonshots Master Series, you need to go to moonshots.io, become a member, and you will every single month get what I think is like the definitive kickoff masterclass for 
first principles, motivation, teamwork. There's some good ones to come. We'll tell you about those later in the show. But become a member, support us, join us uh, as we learn out loud together and how we become the very best version of ourselves. And Mark, there is a practice. If you want to become the best version of yourself, there is this idea called the circle of control or your circle of influence, it's sometimes called. And you know what? Eric has got thoughts on that too. So let's crack into an idea that is very, very powerful. It's a good build on segmenting, which we just talked about. Let's hear from Eric Greetens, author of Resilience, Hard-Won Wisdom for Living a Better Life. Let's get into this idea, circle of control. Everybody has to deal with hardship. Everybody has to deal with struggle. And there's this great quotation from Hemingway. The world is a a hard place. He said, and the world breaks everyone. He said, and many are strong at the broken places. Now, people often remember this phrase, strong at the broken places, but it's also important to remember his qualifier, many. Not all are strong at the broken places. And some people, when they confront hardship, actually end up in a place where they're helpless. Some people are broken by suffering. Some people are, are actually really hurt by pain in such a way that they can't move forward. But it's also the case that some people deal with hardship and become heroic. And one of the things that I've tried to do in these letters to my friend is actually show him what you have to do in a really practical way to actually build resilience and be heroic. Now, one of those things is that you have to learn how to take responsibility. If there was a single question that you can ask someone to measure how resilient they're going to be, you ask them, what are you responsible for? And what you find is that even in the most difficult situations, when you look at stories of people who've been prisoners of war, for example, people who survived said, I'm going to take control of my thoughts. Uh, or I'm going to take control of the way that I breathe. There are certain things, even though my freedom has been taken away from me, that my ability to eat where I live, all of these things have been taken away from me. I'm still going to control something. And when you focus on, on actually taking control of something, then what happens is your circle of control begins to widen and people begin to see that even in the face of hardship and difficulty, there's a way for them to build power and live a purposeful life. Wow, this is such a huge piece of advice, Mike, that I totally believe in and has actually helped me a lot over the past couple of years when you know, some of our liberties uh, got kind of you know taken away or at least restricted because of lockdowns and so on. For me, the idea that I was still in control of something and I could choose what I physically did about it what I mentally did about it was very, very valuable to me. Was it, was it equally uh, a concept, an idea, uh, a mental model that you've, you've encountered and utilized before as well? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's something that I've run into this idea of your circle of control on like where you can put your energy But the relief of saying, hey, something is within my circle of control uh, means you can really devote yourself to it. And when you say this is totally out of my circle of control, um, then you can kind of say, all right, well, I mean, you know, the weather is, for example, something that's totally out of my circle of control. So that's a very uh, like casual kind of thing. But there's many other things that, that, that form that, um, totally out of your control category. Um, but it's very powerful because apart from knowing where you can put your energy, releasing yourself from like, oh, well, it is completely out of my control to affect this thing. So I will therefore not worry about it. I'm not going to let it, um, ruin my day. I'm going to focus on the things that I control. And the benefit for me, Mark, has been that when I make a choice to be very focused on the things I control and I do them, that is the start of feeling fulfilled in life. Like for example, if you say my work ethic, okay, how much I give to the tasks at hand, this is something that I have complete control over. Whether I get the results or not, or if it, that, that project or that task has a lot of dependencies that are out of my control, 
The bare minimum I can say is I turned up and in America they have this great saying that you leave it all on the field, meaning regardless of the result of your sports game, you the individual or hopefully you the team played as hard as you could for as long as you could. You gave your best. There's zero left in the tank. That is something that, uh, I mean, to use the sports analogy, if you lost the game, but you gave it everything you can, it becomes far more easier to feel, to not only accept the outcome, but actually to still feel, you know, satisfied or even a level of fulfillment and pride. Like, hey, I turned up and gave my best. And in the end, giving all of you got, like in terms of your work ethic, is directly within your control. So when you did that, you can kind of accept the result because like, well, I turned up, like I worked damn hard. I mean, that's how it's kind of worked for me. And of course, yes, you know, all the challenges of, of 2020 and 2021, it's like, okay, have probably made me more aware of my thoughts, my words, my actions, my reactions, my decisions, my attitudes, and my mood. All of those items, Mark, I believe are within our control and, and would meet Eric Gritton's um, you know, practice of focusing on those things. Which of those do you think when you when I go through that list, is there one there that you're like, hey, you know what? I should spend more time acknowledging that this one is in my control. Mm. Is any of those kind of strike you? You've maybe kind of um, let it slip out of your circle of control. I, I, I think the, uh, so I'll, I'll just revisit them for our, for our listeners, you know, your thoughts, your words, your actions and behavior, your reactions, your decisions and choices, your attitude and mindset, your mood, your work, work ethic are all within your direct control, aren't they, Mike? For me, mm. I think the one that I can still work on or that I should prioritize working on mm. are my emotional elements, my reactions. Mm. And I don't mean reactions from a physical um, perspective, you know, throwing a punch or whatever. It's reactions to um, myself internally. Mm. So how am I reacting to this situation? Ah, interesting. I have a lot of anxiety over this issue. Okay, well, let's have a look. How can I proactively fix this? Okay, yeah. what might it be? That's, that's, I think, something that bubbles to the surface when I reflect on things that are within my direct circle of control. Mm. Mm. And it's very powerful, isn't it? So this, I want you to imagine as you're listening to us talk, there's like three concentric circles right in the target are things like your thoughts, your reactions, your choices. Your, those are all directly within your circle of control. Now, the second layer are things that you have some effect on, but you don't have total control. Mark, what's a good idea uh, or a good example of things in this second band of control? Well, directly related to the area that I want to work on, so my reactions, my emotions to things, something that are not directly in my control are other people's thoughts. You know, how mm. other people might be thinking about me or about the work that I do. I can't really control that, can I, Mike? You, you have some effect and um, you can do your best. You can make your case to other people, hey, here's what I've done. Here's how I've gone about it. Even if the result is not what you want, it's, a, it's amazing. Um, like I think the goodness in people is when they actually can understand the effort and the contribution that someone has done their best. I think that can, can help. But in the end, if someone wants to draw a different conclusion from that, then you have to accept that. You have to say, I accept that you choose to perceive it in a different way. Mm. Um, you know, and I think another a good one is, um, you know, what's not in your direct control. And I'm saying this as a parent is your child's future. So, you know, some parents, they love their kids. They want the best for their kids. But, you know, in the end, they have some influence on that. They can bring certainly opportunity, good counsel, safety, love, all that good stuff. But in the end, they don't have total control because it's kind of up to the kid who they want to be, right? Um, so that's a good example, isn't it? What else is a good example of this second circle of control where you don't have total control but you have some influence? I think... One that might be on people's mind is is from a social media perspective. You know, you might have 
influence or you might inspire people to perhaps follow you on social media, but you can't really directly control, Mike, who actually follows you on social media, can you? Totally, totally true. And and so you can put your be- the best version of yourself out there. And then, you know, again, this is how Eric Greetings is helping us be resilient. You did your best effort. You, you made your case in this kind of second area. You did what you could for others, but in the end, their actions will be their choices. And this builds us a bridge to this third circle, which is things you have zero zero control over, right? So this is when, let's keep the social media line going. This is when people who you don't know come and attack you, criticize you, um, do all sorts of crazy stuff. So Mark, I've got a great example of this. We, uh, we had a review of our show, um, a couple of years ago and, uh, the listener was absolutely shocked um, and thought it was terrible that we didn't interview personally these people, but that we were um, playing clips of these people. And in their uh, perception, um, what we were doing was incredibly deceptive to our audience. Um, and um, my first thought is like, well, we never said that we were interviewing. We, But what you find yourself doing is you're, you're – um, tempted to be in a conversation with that person. But the best thing you can do is say, I have zero control of that person. I don't even know them. They are drawing a conclusion that is pretty unusual um, for me. And you know what you do is you forget about it. You do, just ignore it. Joe Rogan famously said like, he doesn't read any comments anymore. Um, on his work because he has zero control over it, but it is incredibly distracting. It can get you very off track. So a big thing here is you've got these three circles, your inner circle, total control, your thoughts, your effort. The second band of control, these are things that are affected, you know, traditionally this is how you're working with others, um, how you work within your family or your workplace. You have some influence but not total control, that's for sure. And the third one is like the weather, the traffic, (laughs) what what crazies do out on social media, uh, getting trolled. You have zero control of it. So best to avoid worrying about it. You can read about these things if you choose but don't allow yourself to become occupied with them because you have no influence, right? You have absolutely no influence on it. So where you can take, particularly when the world is crazy and this outer band of things, focus more on the things that you're doing and that you control because you can derive satisfaction, you can derive fulfillment from them. I think this is a massive idea, don't you, Mike? I mean, what a useful breakdown of these different uh, circles, inner all the way to outer control circles. Yeah. I mean, I feel, Mike, as though I, I need to print this off and put it on my wall <laughs> to reflect upon because, you know, much like Angela Duckworth's grit score, I feel as though this, um, this uh, I suppose, mental model can be referred back to in the future, can't it? Yeah. It's a reminder yeah. or not necessarily a mantra, but it is something, a template that you can refer back to and say, okay, well, am I wasting time by worrying about that stranger's comments on social media? Mm. Yes. In which case, as Eric would encourage us to do, go and use it more productively and proactively and beneficially by working on something that you can control. I mean, this is a huge distinction. Yeah. And what a great build off the work of Angela Duckworth, who's made the case for resilience. And now Eric is like, this is how you do it. And I think what we have left till the end of the show is perhaps one of the most newest thoughts, uh, surprising thoughts from author Eric Greetens. So let's have a listen to his thoughts on how we find a model for life. Imagine that someone came to you and placed a giant bag of jigsaw puzzle pieces on the table in front of you and asked you to put all the pieces together. Now think like, what's the first thing you'd ask for? First, you'd probably ask for a reason. Why are you asking me to do a puzzle? But if for the moment you accept that you're going to do the puzzle, 
What would you ask for? I'm guessing you'd ask for a picture. You'd want to know how all of the pieces come together. You'd want to know what you're trying to make. Now, here's the thing. Life hands you pieces. You have to figure out how to put them together. Your life doesn't come with a picture of what it's supposed to look like on the box. You have to. You get to choose that picture for yourself. And you choose it by looking for a model of a life well lived. I started boxing when I was 19. I was in college, and during the day on campus, I studied Aristotle. Now, Aristotle told his students that what is valuable and pleasant to a morally good person actually is valuable and pleasant. In other words, you know what the good thing is by seeing what the good person does. If you want to know how to live well, don't make things more complicated than they need to be. Just look at a model of someone who's already living well. Start there. After reading Aristotle in class, I'd drive into Durham and make my way to a small boxing gym that was tucked in a corner of a rough neighborhood. There, Earl, my trainer, and I would train with Derek, my training partner. Now, Derek worked in construction. Uh, he was a tall, strong, fast fighter, and he'd fought professionally. When I asked Earl, how do I throw a jab, he said, watch Derek. Do as he does. When Earl let me start training on the heavy bag, he'd have me watch Derek. He'd say, there's your picture, Eric. Watch how Derek works the bag. Derek was my model. And I learned faster by watching and imitating him than I ever could have done by reading a book or listening to a coach alone. Earl and Aristotle, they both said the same thing. Find a model and do as they do. What's strange about the way most of us live is that we know how important it is to have models. Everyone wants their children to have good role models. Yet once we become adults, too often we stop looking. And that leads to a lot of unnecessary pain. So at any age, in any endeavor, ask yourself, who's my model? This is so true. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark, I feel like we, we, uh, we must have a whole series on a life well lived <laughs> and study some people that had that. I mean, this is a big thought. And he's right on so many counts. One, we are not given... The, uh, the picture of the puzzle and the pieces for life. We just oh. get given the pieces. How good is that? Great metaphor. So Great. Good. And then he goes on to say, like, as kids, we all have role models. And then what happens? We all become adults and think we've solved it all. But actually, that's when life is just getting real. Hence, I would propose to you, and maybe I'm being a little indulgent here, that that's what we're trying to do on this show, Mark. I mean, we study these people who are role models for us David Goggins, Matthew McConaughey, Eckhart Tolle that we've talked about, Brené Brown, Dale Carnegie, Wim Hof, I mean, oh my gosh, Michelle Obama, Oprah Winfrey, like there are all these amazing people, even just in the last show, Angela Duckworth. They are all revealing something uh, to us. If we can follow their example, and what do we do here, Mark? We ask, how do we do it, don't we? How do you do it? I mean, exactly as Eric calls out in that story as well. How do I throw a jab? Watch Derek. How do yeah. I punch the, the the heavy bag? Watch Derek. This mm. is what we're doing, Mike. Our oh, moonshot is our move shot is Derek's. How do you do it? Listen to the Moonshots podcast. Ah, oh, there's the, there's the line <laughs> that we were promising in last week's episode. Oh, that's dear. right. That's the sign oh, of. <laughs> so, Mike. Um, Mental rehearsal, segmenting, circle of control, model for life. Which one? Which one has got you thinking the most? All of them. <laughs> I'll I'll take all of them, please. Okay. Um, all right. <laughs> no, I think I think the one that has surprised me actually is the that final clip from Eric. Find a role model or find a model for life. I think that really packages up really really well for me how I, A, want to find out what, what kind of makes me tick, what's my passion, what's values and so on, and B, how might I be able to practice some of those um, skills around patience, around resilience better. So that for me is, is the homework that I'm taking away. Gotcha. Well, I, I would say um, anywhere you go with those big four ideas, there's, there's like a lot of work to do sitting inside of this book. But um, Mark, 
Thank you. Thank you for helping me navigate resilience and grit so far. We have another show to come. It's been absolutely uh, empowering, this series. It, it's, it's the tool set for surviving, for thriving in, in life. So thank you to you, Mark, and thank you to you, our listeners, because it really is a joy to learn out loud together, to try and be better every single day, even if it's just 1%. Thank you to you. And today we definitely gave things a big nudge forward with Eric Greetens, author of Resilience, Hard-Won Wisdom for Living a Better Life. And this whole wisdom that he has for us starts with a letter that he wrote to his friend, Zach. And it started with number one, mentally rehearse. Ask yourself, what's the worst could ha- that could happen and improve upon it? Two, he said, look, building toughness It's all about segmenting. Put it into small, attackable pieces. Don't regret the past. Don't worry about the future. Be in the here and now. You can do this. You can focus on your circle of control because that's where you can forge your strength. Focus on the things that you control. Bring your best self and your best effort. And if we do all of those things, we can start to look forward. We can find some of the pictures to the puzzle pieces in the inspiration of others. We can find a model for life. We can find many role models. So don't just abandon them once you become an adult. Hold on to them, go deeper and find all those people that can inspire you to be the best version of yourself. And that is exactly what we do here together on this show, the Moonshots Podcast. That's a wrap.